Welcome to session six, everyone. Session six is about cost, access, and quality. And cost, access, and quality is discussed under chapter 12 in your textbook. There are a few things I first want to discuss before I proceed with the main lectures. First is that there will be themes or topics that will be discussed that are outside of chapter 12, but they are related to this particular topic that we're talking about, the Iron Triangle of Healthcare. So play, uh, pay attention to those slides because it will tell you where you will find uh, on which chapters those topics are discussed in your textbook. And those slides will actually tell you the pages also that you will have to go to in your textbook and do some additional reading because it's important as they will be included in this lecture. Okay, the second thing uh, I'd like to remind everyone is that your semestral project, which is your term paper, uh, the basis of that project is this learning session that we're doing right now, cost, access, and quality. If you remember the rubric I gave you, the centerpiece of the term paper is one of these domains, either cost, access, or quality in relation to a particular disease or a health topic that you want to discuss. Third, and before I proceed, uh, the last thing I'd like to discuss with you is that this session culminates with your assignment. Your assignment is designed to help you uh, get set up and get started with your paper. That can only be accessed after you have gone through each section of this session sequentially because this is a learning module. Okay, so I think we are ready to proceed. So again, cost, access, and quality uh, are the three major cornerstones of the U.S. healthcare system. They are therefore known as the domains, the three domains of the cornerstones. And they're also known as the iron triangle of healthcare. It's an iron triangle because they are all interconnected. One cannot exist without the other. They are always related. So what it does is that is there is an ex there is an interactive relationship that exists between all three. So cost is the cost of healthcare. Access is the people's ability to get healthcare when they need it, and quality is the quality of services delivered, healthcare services provided to patients. So in this first part of the session, let's talk about the cost of healthcare. Cost can be understood and viewed from two different perspectives. And these are micro perspective and macro perspective. So the first example of a micro perspective view of cost is from a consumer, that will be us. How much does going to a doctor cost? How much do I have to shell out for co-pays or deductibles or co-insurance? Um, if you want to look further and look at your paycheck, for instance, it will tell you how much it costs you per paycheck in terms of your contribution to your healthcare premium, your healthcare coverage, because your healthcare coverage is partly shouldered by you in a smaller portion and a bigger proportion is taken care of by your employer if that is how you get your health coverage. Now, for macro perspective, the perspective that the government has is the perfect example for this particular uh, way of looking at healthcare. So the government actually looks at cost of healthcare as an expenditure. Otherwise, then it is known as healthcare expenditure or healthcare spending. This is the formula for healthcare expenditure, whereas the price multiplied by the quantity equals expenditure. So P is for price, the price of the service 
or the healthcare goods, how much of that healthcare service was uh, needed or given. And if you multiply that, that then becomes the expenditure or spending per se. And that is a macro perspective way of looking at healthcare costs. So it reflects how much of a country, how a nation consumes economic resources related to healthcare. And these resources are health insurance, the skills of professionals like doctors, medications, equipment, uh, discoveries for medical technology and research. A third example, which is another example of micro perspective, is from a provider standpoint. So a provider has to think of overhead expenses. How much do I have to budget to operate my clinic? How much do I have to spend on capital? How much do I have to spend on rental, supplies, information technology? All these requirements. So from a provider perspective, which could either be an individual doctor, a clinic as a whole, a health center as a whole, or even a hospital as a whole, when they think about the expenses that they have to put out, uh, that is also micro perspective. So that is very similar to the perspective that we have as consumers. So in this case, we only use the government as the only example for having a macro perspective. This is one of the buzzwords right now. Uh, healthcare cost is really high. We've learned that in chapter one. We spend so much money, almost 18% of our gross domestic product towards healthcare. And this trend actually started in the 1970s. And what really prompted this was the creation of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. So what happened when Medicare and Medicaid was passed? The main effect that we saw was that it provided additional access to certain subgroups of the population. Medicare provided access to the elderly, additional access to additional portions of the elderly, and Medicaid the first time actually gave additional access to the poor, medically indigent. What did this do? It increased the demand, and therefore, if you increase the demand economically, it is going to increase the cost. Another reason for high cost of healthcare is a third party payment system that we adhere to. Now, the third party is referred to as the health insurance companies. So they are, they comprise about a third of all the payers, the ones, the expenditures for healthcare spending. And we will talk more about health insurance companies and their role in the cost of healthcare uh, when we talk about healthcare finance. The next reason for high cost in healthcare is our dependence on operating our healthcare system uh, in the semblance of a market. It's like we're selling an economic good, an economic service. So what happens is that the, in reality, the use of healthcare is driven by need and not by demand. Now, the law of supply and demand is one of the main philosophies of a market economy. But the fact is, Healthcare is driven by need, it's not demand. For instance, the car industry is thriving because there is a demand for a car. Well, is there a need for a car? You can argue with that, but some people probably don't need it, but they need it any, they want it anyway. So let's talk about other products like a cologne, uh, or a shampoo, or a soap. Um, some people could argue that they need it, but do we really need it? Can we survive without it? Perhaps so. So it's really demand that drives uh, market sales of these things. Another thing is that quantity of healthcare produced 
is usually higher than in competitive markets. So we produce more healthcare services. And prices are always higher than the true cost of production. Next reason is our dependence on technology. So the growth of technology requires a lot of expenditure, a lot of investment, and it has a direct relationship with the increase of healthcare costs in the States. Once technology is created, people discover it and people then start asking for it and demanding for it. It also raises the expectations of people. It, it, it's medical technology that people depend on and, and, and basically rely on to treat more and more medical conditions. Another reason for high cost is the increasing uh, portion of the elderly population. Uh, towards or in relation to the general population of the country. Uh, we all know that elderly patients need more medical services, they need more medications, they probably require more hospitalizations and doctor's visits. And therefore, uh, studies have shown that they use as much as three and a half times more than the average person in terms of using healthcare services. Now we are increasing, we are seeing an increase in life expectancy, meaning people are living longer. And therefore the subpopulation of the elderly in proportion to the general population is growing. Now, one of the things we will talk about this when we talk about long-term care is that while life ex expectancy is growing, it's not necessarily um, commensurate to the improvement in quality of life. So people could live longer, but their quality of life is not necessarily much better, which means they will actually be needing more healthcare services. Now this reason, medical model of healthcare delivery or the biomedical model of healthcare delivery, we have discussed in chapter two. And the medical model starts when the medical students enter medical school. And this model emphasizes medical intervention and prevention is actually relegated to a back burner. And although there has been strides in getting this uh, more adopted as a public policy, health promotion and disease prevention still does not have the same spot in terms of importance in the healthcare delivery of the United States compared to the one in Great Britain, for example, where prevention is given a lot of emphasis. Next reason for the high cost of healthcare in the United States is the multi-payer system and administrative costs that we have. So, both of this we will actually be talking more about in healthcare finance, but let's have a little uh, overview. So, multi-payer system meaning we have a lot of subsystems, okay? This requires expertise uh, on, on staff, meaning somebody will have to be a master of, say, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and another one is a master of HIP or Aetna, and you know, how they do business and things like that. But overall, that contributes to higher administrative costs. So administrative costs are those expenditures that are required to manage financing, insurance claims, payment functions. This also uh, includes paying people to manage enrollment, um, to monitor utilization of healthcare services, especially claims processing. Now, denial is an appeal, so when insurance companies receive these claims and they deny it, they send it back to the provider, then we need to file another claim, things like that. And then, of course, also marketing and promotion. So, in the United States, apparently, research has shown that administrative costs uh, can actually 
take up as much as 25% of all the healthcare expenditures. Now, if you remember and we looked at the healthcare system of Taiwan, where there is no, literally no administrative cost because people carry their own cards and when they go see the doctor, the doctor enters into the machine, there will, there are, there's no need for filing claims and everything because uh, all the records are directly sent to the national uh, insurance system of the country. And therefore, there's no need for claims processing. There's no denials and appeals. Well, maybe there are, but it, it's not in the same scope and uh, amount that we experience here in the United States. Next is defensive medicine. So I have mentioned earlier that we do live in a very litigious society and that actually promotes a lot of um, litigations from patients that, you know, have a perceived experience, whether true or not, for the most part, they are probably true because of this environment. Uh, providers in the United States do face numerous legal risk, risks when they uh, provide medical care and this requires them to have what we call malpractice insurance. And because of that, it could lead to providers trying to make sure that they cover all their bases and that could lead to increased cost because they might be ordering tests that may not be um, necessary. So, you know, if there's no tort reform law or there's no restrictions in malpractice claims, this actually increases malpractice insurance and also increases the instance of this this claims um, and happening. And eventually that leads to increased healthcare costs. All right, waste and abuse. So this is a very uh, sad fact and it, 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 it does exist. And unfortunately it causes increase in healthcare costs in the US. So Waste and abuse happens when fraud happens, and fraud is defined as the knowing disregard of the truth. The truth. So an example is, you know, when billing claims are intentionally falsified, it's like padding the bill. And fraud is a major problem in Medicare and Medicaid. So examples would be providing services that are not medically necessary. You did provide a service, but it may not be necessary, or padding the price. Of that particular service. Medicare alone spends millions of millions of dollars just to investigate fraud because if they don't invest in those, with those millions of dollars to investigate fraud to prevent it, they would actually lose billions more. So you could just imagine that that money used to investigate fraud could actually be used for other resources and that is indeed a big waste. How about we flip the coin and look at the other side? If, if there are several reasons why healthcare cost is so expensive in the United States, the government has to be doing something to curtail these costs. Well, one example or one thing that governments have done, particularly governments with universal healthcare, is that they employ what we call health planning. So this is an undertaking by the government to literally have a plan on how to distribute and make healthcare resources available. And it's almost looking at how could we make the services available that could reach as many people as we can with the best health outcomes for everyone. In the United States, this is not necessarily the main guiding principle in health planning. Um, because we are predominantly a market system, is the market forces that govern the system and that determines the prices of healthcare services and healthcare goods. 
Now, what about directly controlling the amount that is going to be spent, meaning the price of the services itself? Is there a way to actually control them? So for this particular topic, price controls, there are several subtopics here that you will have to read up on a separate chapter in your book. So you have to read up on pages 143 to 146 of your textbook for this particular one. So one of the most notable things that happened that directly talks about price controls in the United States is what Medicare did for payments for uh, hospital stays. So Medicare reimbursements, we will talk about all these terminologies in the following slides. Basically, what they did was they shifted from retrospective reimbursement to prospective uh, reimbursement system by using diagnosis-related groups. Now, what are these things? So let's go through each of these terminologies. First, let's talk about reimbursement. So when we talk about payments for healthcare services, we are actually talking about reimbursements. So these are payments made by health insurance companies, third-party payer sources, to the providers of healthcare. So it could be an individual provider, a clinic, a hospital. Uh, now, why is it called a reimbursement? And what does reimbursement simply mean? So reimbursement means you would have already uh, shelled out the money for something, right? So when you do travel for work, for instance, you buy your ticket, you book your hotel, you pay for your meals. When you get back, and because it's official business, you could actually file for reimbursement. You, sub you submit all your receipts, and then you get back all the money that you spent for it. Now, mm -hmm. payments for healthcare services are called reimbursements because that's exactly what happens. Because it is basically a settlement for services provided beforehand. So the services that were given have already used up resources that the, provided, the provider used up at the time of the patient's visit. And reimbursements are only done after providers have filed a claim and submitted all the necessary documents for that particular service or services that were given to that particular patient who is a member of that health insurance plan. So let's talk about the two types, the two main types of reimbursements in healthcare. There are actually uh, several more, but for the purposes of this course, which is quite foundational, as I've mentioned to you at the start of the semester, we're only going to concentrate on these two main types. The first is retrospective reimbursement. And the most common example for retrospective reimbursement is called fee-for-service reimbursement. So fee-for-service reimbursement is based on the premise that each type of service given to a patient is paid for by looking back at historical data or historical claims and at the total cost of service at the time of filing the claim. So it's based on cost like length of stay for hospitalization, for instance, services rendered, cost of providing service. Now, this has turned out to be really costly because it's problematic. It gives providers the incentive to provide service that may not be essential or necessary because providers can increase their incomes by increasing the volume of services that they receive. So if you get admitted into a hospital, there's no set standard of what is going to be done to you and what type of services. So hospitals can actually keep on doing services because they know with retrospective reimbursement, when they file the claim, those services will be retrospectively looked at and will be paid for based on each unit of service. So again, it sort of gives providers incentives to do more so that they can get paid more. On the other hand, this is what Medicaid shifted to. On the other hand, we have prospective reimbursement. So prospective reimbursement uses certain pre-established criteria to come up in advance 
how much the reimbursement is going to be when the claim is filed by the provider, by the clinic, by the hospital. And Medicare started this concept in 1983 for hospital stays, and they do it mainly through diagnosis-related groups. So it, this is best understood by understanding what DRGs are, diagnosis-related groups. So there are approximately 500 DRGs, and each DRG is a group of principal diagnoses that are put together for the reason of admission. So for instance, myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Uh, what they did was they gathered data in the past and they collated and analyzed this data. And basically they were able to identify the principal diagnoses and the services that are actually done for each type of admission. In this case, we're using the example of a heart attack. So now they have an idea what type of diagnosis are actually used for that particular admission. So they were able to determine what diagnosis will be used for a heart attack admission, and they were able to determine how long the stay should be and what type of services should be given. So continuing on with DRG, um, each DRG corresponds to the most prevalent diagnosis and the type of service um, patients have based on that research they have done uh, upon admission to the hospital for that particular reason. And in this case, reimbursement rates are bundled services based on that group of diagnosis for that particular admission. Hospitals really um, don't have a choice in choosing what diagnosis is going to DRGs because the government determined this in advance and hospitals receive it from the government and you know the government will give them guidelines this is what this DRG is for it's for a heart attack and these is the fixed rate for that particular bundle of services that you're supposed to give to a patient who's admitted with a heart attack now this might be a little bit confusing because perspective really means looking forward, right? But perspective really is just a terminology because it's used for the bundled type of services. It's perspective because you're looking forward in terms of that admission that moving forward once this patient is admitted, these are the types of bundled services the patient is going to receive. Now, even if it's called perspective, not historical, it is still reimbursement because the payment is only done after the services are given to the patient and only after the claim has been filed by the provider or the hospital in this case. Now, how does perspective reimbursement uh, reduce the cost or the price of services. Well, it cuts the cost because it removes the incentive for providers to add more services that are non-essential for that particular admission, which can then increase their payment. So if you don't have that incentive anymore, you're sort of uh, put inside a box of that bundled payment, bundled payment for a particular type of service. You don't really want to add more services that is not going to get paid anyway. And it's also helpful not only for payers, such as insurance companies and Medicare, for instance, the government. It actually helps hospitals too, because they can better predict healthcare spending and how to budget. So in 2000, Prospective reimbursement was extended to outpatient. So it started with inpatient care through DRGs. Now, how would they do this in outpatient care? So it was started in 2000. And if we use the example of DRGs for inpatient or hospitalization, for outpatient, we're going to use the example of capitation method. So capitation simply means per head, uh, per head and this amounts to monthly payments given to clinics, uh, doctor's offices, a provider itself, for each patient that is signed up with the insurance company, who is, in other words, a member 
from of that insurance plan to that provider to receive health services. This is the reason why we are encouraged or why we can only see, depending on the health plan we have, that we can only see providers that are within our network because those providers are paid a capitated fee for each of us. And regardless of how much services we receive, the provider receives a flat payment. So the capitated fee is always given. So this encourages providers to only provide and give the amount of services that is within the budget of that monthly capitated fee. The last approach um, or um, the last cost containment approach that we're going to discuss is uh, competitive approaches. So first is uh, what we call demand side incentives. Demand side incentives is demand refers to us because we are the ones, we are the healthcare consumers, we are the ones that demand for the services. And incentives meaning it requires us to share the cost of healthcare. And we are slowly feeling this with increased uh, portions of paying our healthcare insurance premiums, for instance, also higher cost of co-pays and higher deductibles and higher co-insurance. So it makes us aware that insurance is not free, that we don't get it for free. It actually also comes out of our own pocket and it encourages us to be more conscious on how to use healthcare services. Because the more we go to the doctor, the more we pay, um, the more we shell out co-pays, the more we shell out co-insurance, the more deductible we actually have to uh, shell out. And this is a good example of making us feel that you know health services is not exactly free just because you have health insurance. 